Okay, so my presentation is basically about um, the parts of history that we were taught in an over romanticized or just wrong version. So misconceptions of the past. So the first is Joan of Arc. I'm pretty sure everybody here has heard of Joan of Arc. If not, Joan of Arc is basically thought to have lived in the early 15th century and she was known for apparently leading the French army to success over the English with divine connections. Basically the concept of her was that she had a connection of religious, I'm pretty sure she claimed it was religious. The population saw it as more witch-like, which ties in later, but um, a religious connection that let her have this knowledge of what the other army knew. And therefore she led the French army to victory and she was revered in French society, especially for many, many hundreds of years after her death. But she was apparently captured and burned as a witch on the stake in the marketplace of Rowan at age 19. And the concept is that, you know, she was a teenager who was just a genius and because, well, not genius, she had a divine connections and therefore was capable of having these genius-like results. However, when people start doing genuine research into this and uh, professors in especially European countries started opening up their records, they had they learned some new things. So the first thing they learned is Joan of Arc, Joan d'Arc, I don't actually know how to pronounce that, which would have been Joan of Arc. Her name was probably Joan d'Arcs. Like it was not even close to d'Arc because there was no um, apostrophe used in France until 300 years after her death. So it was clearly, that wasn't even her name, which it makes sense that this um, mistake could occur considering the fact that there's many mispronunciations through history, except also there's no place named Ark that she could have came from. There is no of Ark. So plain, first of all, her identity in itself has been recorded incorrectly. Now, there is the claim, of course, that she led the French army to success over the English with divine connections. However, her family severely despised the French and could not have helped that army. Her father's letters threatened to strangle anyone he is close to if they turn out to support the French. Growing up in this type of environment, the chances that she would have supported the French army are little to none, especially considering the lack of a freedom of thought that a woman would have had at that time. And not even a lack of freedom of thought, say she rebelled in her own head, the place that she came from was already very commonly attacked by the French. It was not treated well by the French government. So the fact that she would support the French army, it's logically incorrect. And she lived past 19 and was not executed for being a witch. The workers at her church proved that she got married to this man at age 18 and had two children. If she was married at 18 and had two children and that could not have happened in the span of 18 to 19. So the, chance, so the overall conclusion is that Joan of Arc existed because Joan of Arc did However, she's not the person that history made her out to be. Instead, the, the, the thing that people think is that she was so romanticized because the French army committed so many atrocities that they needed some person to put at a pedestal and kind of look at in a positive light as compared to all the negative stuff that happened at that time. So next, the ninja. We've all heard about a ninja, you know, killers for hire, use by anyone who can afford them, person of stealth, dressed in black, tends to be a, of East Asian descent in Western uh, media, though normally, logically, people claim it as Japanese, but most of the time, anybody who's decepting such a ninja is of East Asian descent, not just Japanese, as nin means stealth and jo means person in Japanese, <clears throat> and use un unconventional weapons and gymnastics to achieve their often murderous goal. However, when you look at the facts, Ninja is a word used in Japan, is not a word used in Japan. Although the parts of it exist, the concept of the word ninja was created by Western people learning the, the entire um, language. And they came up with this as with the further, I'll come back to that. So the closest thing is a shinobi. The shinobi sold gossip and intelligence from around the house to the main residence. The way that the reason that people think the shinobi was like the ninja and why the common thought is that maybe this is where it came from is because the ninja was is commonly decepted as somebody who not only hides physically in the shadows, but blends in as the shinobi sold gossip and intelligence, they blended in and they did things for the person paying for them. 
is that they didn't kill anybody. They simply um, sold intelligence. So killers for hire would be samurai brought in for any murder. However, samurai are not discreet. They're not very hidden. People know who a samurai is, and a samurai is known for being such. They're not hiding from authority. They're known by authority. It's like a very, um, it's defi defying law enforcement in a very articulated manner. So the concept of a black clad killer that the ninja has is from stagehands. So stagehands in um, traditional Japanese plays are dressed in black to be not noticed by the majority of the um, people in the audience. And it's not that they weren't noticed, it's that it was societal thought that, well, the stagehands, people dressed in black, not meant to be noticed. So that they weren't noticed, it's that they weren't meant to be. So when people were killers in said plays, they would dress like the stagehands in complete black because, well, so the audience would then register, look at this person. This person is also not meant to be noticed as their killers. So when Western, so when people from various Western civilizations came and started exploring this environment and exploring this country, they kind of mashed together all this stuff and it, kind of, it became a ninja-like phenomenon as a result of Western media needing some sort of representation from East Asians. That's a lot of stereotypes from East Asia come from basically the West not having enough stereotypes. It's really upsetting to think about it that way. But when you look at most of the world from the spectacle of especially American media, you see there's a group of stereotypes that are commonly referred to. And the ninja is a sad victim of this train of thought. Next, Marco Polo is the travels of Marco Polo. So in case you're unfamiliar, Marco Polo, The Travels of Marco Polo, this is a translation, I cannot pronounce the actual book title, is an adventure journal on Marco Polo's travels to China. So apparently it was dictated to his inmate who was captured alongside him at one point. Um, it's thought to be in Europe. So that whole um, book was written by this per his inmate. So he claims to be the first European to visit a Mongolian leader at the time who was I might not be pronouncing this right, Kublai Khan at the time. And he says he, is, he, became a con, he became trusted by this man because he stayed for 17 years. And as the only European person, he had this sort of fame that made him, you know, rise up in the ranks of this man's, of this man's government. So, or so-called government. Mongolia did not have a very established government. It was more of a monarchy that did not result from any levels of intelligence, rather, it was a result of blood relations. So he claimed to be an inter he claimed to be an intermediary between Khan and the current Pope, Pope Gregory X, and says his family was incredibly well incredibly wealthy. So these travelers, he was like, he claims to be a family of rich travelers that do things for important people. However, when you look at the book, all but 18 sentences are in the first person, which is fine because you can think that, well, Marco Polo dictated it, and so the inmate wrote it down, and it may just be in first person because of that. However, it planted some seeds of doubt in people's minds. The first person to actually meet a Khan was Giovanni da Pian del Carpine. I butchered that, my apologies, who met the grandson of Genghis Khan with a message from, the, from Pope Innocent IV. I do not know what number that is. So the whole claim that he was the first European person is wrong. And this man met the, this first European man um, went on his journey about 20 years prior to his existence. So not close enough that Marco Polo would have known and had reasons to say that he wasn't the first and not far enough that this government, this Mongolian government wouldn't even have a clue. And he had no proficiency in any of the languages of Mongolia at the time. He did not, how could he have stayed for 18 years and not picked up a thing? That's a very, very commonly thought about question. And he could not have communicated with the Khan if he didn't even know this language. There's so many loopholes when you look at the knowledge that he portrayed as a result of this journey. And he doesn't even describe any cultural differences in his journal. So people say that of most um, sociologists, not sociologists, most anthropologists that have taken the time to look at this man and the people that observe you know, history and the results of culture, cultural differences, say that he should have at least thought of the commonalities between dumplings and ravioli, between the differences of how they cooked various forms of noodles or pasta and how you know, it's the same food, but 
the Mongolians cooked it in a more stir fry manner and they boiled it first. There's just so many differences that are similar enough that it should have marked enough of a notice and a sign for him to write it down. Most importantly, he does not even mention tea. If he were to be as high up in the Khan's ranks to have known to have known him and become a confident, confident for him, he should have had these very royal tea parties that were commonly done as a sign of respect and it was done to discuss important matters. If he does not mention tea once over a course of 17 years of being close with the top of royalty, there is bound to be doubt in, doubt in people's minds. And finally, his family was little over small time traders. They were not known for much. This book is what got him to fame, especially considering the troubles of Marco Polo is still in press today. So the most people believe that this man lied and did it for the, not just the attention, but the money, considering they, his family was not as wealthy as he claimed they were. And therefore the travels of Marco Polo is severely, everybody that is, that has researched into it, is severely suspicious of. Countess Dracula. So this slide, side note, will not have much words. I will be speaking this because this entire thing lives very strongly in my mind. So, Countess Dracula lived in the 1600s, a self-proclaimed vampire bathed in the blood of virgins to retain youth, supposedly murdered over 650 peasants, according to records, um, from her kingdom, along with her entire royal court. And it is claimed, uh, media presents Countess Dracula as married to Count Dracula. However, records of Countess Dracula, whose name was actually Elizabeth Buck, uh, her name was Elizabeth, and her last name is hard to pronounce, Elizabeth Bathory. So Elizabeth Bathory, not related to Vlad Dracula. There was no, there was no correlation in the records. However, media and movies, especially movies, made it seem so. So the truth about this woman is, so the whole concept of blood aversions first appeared in records in 1729, which is at least 100 years after she lived. This woman, Countess Dracula, was married to her husband, not out of, not for any reason other than a political marriage. And so they didn't really know each other. They didn't really like each other. They didn't care. So her husband died off in war in 17, <clears throat> her husband first died off war in the 17, 17, in the 1650s. And he died because he died and she didn't really care because she didn't really know him. But in the time that he was off for war, she was highly educated. Most of the royal court at this time could bear, was barely literate and she was educated in six different languages. And so she um, got along with civilians because of her high level of intelligence. Everybody wanted to know her, talk to her and everything. And especially she got along with the court. This is very interesting. She had an all female court. And as a result of all of this, most people believe that the reason she's been labeled as Countess Dracula is simply because nobody believed they, the civilians and the people that were jealous of her power didn't want a woman to have that level of success. So she was not a bad person. She didn't commit any murders. She didn't commit any sort of, she wasn't known as a ruthless person. She wasn't known as unlike at all. The truth of how she was killed and records that were uncovered about 25 years ago, they were very um, overwritten and buried most likely to, um, they, were, they weren't official records. The official records and the, these records were from her uncle who owned, a, who was in charge of a neighboring kingdom, which was much more powerful than this one, much, much more. So people use that kingdom's records for the kingdom surrounding it because the kingdom surrounding it, as this shows, were known for corruption. And also she supposedly murdered over 650 peasants. However, all of the peasants in all of her country and all the 17 neighboring towns were barely 500. So in conclusion, Countess Dracula is yet another victim of the lies of history and how people don't like to, people don't like the actual truth. People want more. Thank you. Those were an overview of a few misconceptions of history.